Another example. A certain public library holds specific items at specific branches or specific patterns. Okay, in other words, suppose you want a particular item at a library. You go and look it up and you find that the item has been issued. Somebody has borrowed the item. So you want to place a hold on the item. You want to place a reservation for the item so that when it becomes available, the library will make it available to you. Okay, so somebody returns the item, then what the library will do is they will hold this item for you to come and pick it up. Okay, so that's what we are talking about here. So, for example, they may say, well, we're going to hold this item at this branch of the library. In fact, at the time you make a reservation, you may say in which, which branch you want it to be held. So they'll say, I'm going to hold this item for you at the Morningside uh, Heights Library for, for you. Right? So the item, the pattern, and the branch of the library are all being mentioned here. Okay? So you've got three entity types, uh, the item, the branch, and the pattern. Library, of course, is not an entity type here because we are talking about this particular library. We don't have many libraries that we are talking about. We are talking about a scenario where we have one library, and therefore, this is it. Now, suppose you are talking about a system of several libraries. Then, of course, library would also be an entity type. In this case, we are talking only about one library, so we are not bothered about it, about it being an entity type. Okay? So in this scenario, you've got branch, you've got library item, you've got patron. All three have to be mentioned when you're talking about a particular hold. Okay? So we are calling that entity type. The associative entity type as hold. An item is being held for somebody. It's called a hold. And your diagram is going to look like this. Notice that, of course, I have used the I've given hold its own primary key okay I'm not using a primary key from uh, you know not using key migration for its primary key it's got its own key primary key and therefore we are not using key migration here okay so once again how many attributes does hold have think about it I hope you got six because it's got three attributes of its own hold ID from date to date and of course because of the one-to-many relationship it's got three more attributes branch ID library item ID or item ID and pattern ID those are of course foreign key attributes because of the one-to-many relationship and of course not only are they foreign key attributes they are also required attributes okay so if you look at hold hold has six required attributes because all the three attributes which are visible are required and we know that these invisible foreign key attributes are also required here okay so we, this is a second example of ternary relationship okay so here as I've said already primary key for hold is hold ID we gave it its own ID and we are not using key migration okay hold has six attributes all of them are required attributes okay so now that really completes our discussion of the ERD modeling concepts we want to cover. Okay, as I've already pointed out earlier, there's one more important concept about ERDs, which not not very important concept, but it's a key, fairly important concept. But in the interest of keeping things simple, I'm not talking about that concept. It's a concept called supertypes and subtypes, which I'm not going to talk about now. Okay, so therefore. Our discussion of ERD concepts is complete, but of course, we need to talk about, we've got the ERD now, the database design, how do I convert it into an actual working database? Right, till now, for all the SQL examples, we had a working database. Okay, it was, that was not a diagram on a piece of paper, that was actually a working database with data against which you were able to execute SQLs. Okay, so the question then is, how do I take this ERD, any ERD that we've got, convert it into a database. Let's look at that. Some of the concepts are, in an ERD, of course, we know we've got entity types, okay? And simply converting it into a database, we would create a table with the same name as the entity type, okay? So if you have a table entity type called student, you'll have a database table called student, okay? What happens to the visible attributes of the entity type? Simple they become columns in the table that we created. 
what happens to the invisible foreign key attributes? Well, they also become columns in the table. And whether or not they are required attributes or optional attributes depends upon the cardinality. Right? The solid line or dash line is going to determine that. And finally, the primary key of the ERD, and we've already seen how to find out what the primary keys are, and that's going to become the primary key of the equivalent table. Okay, so in that sense, the mapping from ERD to database is extremely straightforward. So the moment you are able to draw the ER diagram, you have your database. Okay, so that's as straightforward as that. And because of that, you can imagine that what actually is going to happen is that you're going to use the Oracle Data Modeler to create your entity relationship diagram. And after that, we'll just click a few buttons and we'll get the complete database description file. Okay, you don't have to write any actual code to create the database. Oracle Data Modeler will actually create the file for you. And then all you have to do is to submit the file to a database and your table will be created. I'll show you how all of this is done, step by step. Okay, so for the moment, I just want you to think about the fact that once you have done the ERD, your job is done. Okay, so let's consider an example in the context of which we'll see, review everything that we have looked at so far. Okay, so as usual, we consider something that's really familiar to us. And then later on, I'll be having a hands-on exercise. And in the hands-on exercise, we'll, we'll consider a business example. Okay, so here we are considering something that is simple and straightforward so that uh, the concepts become clear to you. Okay, every course has zero or many sections. Each section is only one course. And a section is identified by a course ID and section name. Okay, we know this already. Course and section, this relationship we've already seen. Now, when I'm drawing ER diagrams for a big scenario, what you'll tend to do is to take it piece by piece and build the diagram incrementally. Okay. In fact, when you do the ER diagram test, I'll give you three or four paragraphs of a business situation just like this. It may not be laid out in bullet points, but pretty much the same information will be available. And all you'll have to do is to look at it sentence by sentence and just convert each sentence into the appropriate entities and relationships just connecting them all up okay it's as simple as that so even though the description might look very long the process of converting into an ERD is actually fairly straightforward you have to focus on just understanding the business situation that's what is more important okay having said that uh, let's look at this okay so course has many sections etc and each section is offered in a particular semester and a semester can have several sections offered in it. So I'm now extending the situation with which we are already familiar. And then we talk about, okay, an instructor can teach many sections and a section may be taught by many instructors. Earlier we had considered a simpler scenario where only one instructor teaches sections. Uh, and a section has only one instructor. And then finally we also bring in students and their registrations. Okay, so we've got a fairly complicated scenario, a fairly complicated university sort of a scenario. Okay, let's take it step by step. First, I'm going to consider just this thing. Of course, the university itself is the context in which we are drawing this diagram. So university need not be an entity type because we're talking about only one university. If you're talking about 100 universities, then of course, that would also be an entity type. But here we are talking about only one, so that's gone. But of course, there are many courses and so on. Okay, this part we are familiar with already. Each course has zero or many sections. Each section is of only one course. And a section is identified by a course ID and section name. Okay, uh, so let's see here. This is the diagram we would come out with. We have seen this before. You've got course, course ID is the primary key. Section, section name is the primary key. And you've got uh, days of the start time. I've just added attributes here. Okay, and we already know that a section has course ID also as part of its primary key. Okay, so that's what we had done earlier. But what this blurb is saying here is, well, what about since we are going to bring in multiple semesters, clearly the same course 
and the same section number can occur in many semesters. For example, course number BITM 3724 or BACC 4101 or BITM 7744, whatever it is. Okay, let's consider uh, BACC 4101AA or BACC 4101WB. That's the section that's being offered this semester. Okay, now it's definitely next year, fall semester, BACC 4101AWB uh, is going to occur again. Okay, so even this combination of course number plus section name is not unique because if you keep data across multiple semesters as you must you can't just say the semester is over I'm going to throw away all the data no it's got to be there historical information right so if you have to do that then course number section name alone won't do okay so in a multiple semester scenario this doesn't work as I've already pointed out so what do you do let's take it one step at a time okay so we've seen this course ID section name is not unique. Well, the next sentence says each section is offered in a particular semester and a semester can have several sections offered in it. Okay, so now we bring in semester also here. Okay, and of course we can see that adding semester ID would make the section's primary key unique. So the section's primary key would be course ID plus semester ID plus, of course, section name. So we'll now say BI, uh, BACC 4101 WB and the section name would be, for example, fall 2014. Okay, That combination is unique right? because the same section name during the same semester is not going to occur again for the same course. If the same course is offered in multiple sections, obviously the section name is going to be different. It will be AA or AB or if it's web-based, you know, maybe WB, WB1 or whatever. Okay, so the section name will be different. Therefore, the combination of all of these three is unique and therefore we now say, you know what, the primary key for section is not just course ID and section name, but it also includes the semester ID. And that is why I have included the key migration Okay, so when you're drawing ER diagrams, you have to think about what each entity type means and what's going to make up the primary key for that. And when you think about what an entity type means, go back to its instances. Okay, what does an instance of this entity type actually mean? What does an instance look like? Okay, once you have that, you can say, well, what is then going to uniquely identify an instance? And then you'll be able to make out the primary key for that and figure out any key migrations that are needed. Okay. Alternately, if you look at it differently, you can say, well, a course is offered in many semesters and within a semester there are several courses being offered. That's a many-to-many -many relationship and therefore you can actually think of section as the associative entity between course and semester. Okay. That is also perfectly possible. Through that route also you can arrive at section as an entity type with this sort of key migration that is shown here. Okay, make sure you understand this part. It's pretty uh, subtle and you need to understand this properly. Okay, so that's what we have seen uh, so far. Okay, so that clarifies our problem about section and its key. Then we add on some more. We say each instructor can teach zero or more section and a section is taught by one or more instructors. Okay. So that's that will give us this many-to-many -many relationship. Now, just for convenience, I am not showing the other entity types that we have already drawn in the earlier pages. For now, I am only considering this. Eventually, we will put it all together and see one big diagram. Okay. So now, section we already know has relationships to other entity types. I am just not showing that here. Okay. Uh, so you've got section and instructor, and it's a many-to-many -many relationship, and therefore we need to clearly have an associative entity type and I'm calling that as a location. Okay. Now whenever you have an associative entity type you have to think up of a good name for it. Okay. One kind of common approach to naming an associative entity is 
to just put together the name of the participating entities. Okay. In other words, you will find some people who recommend calling this associative entity as simply section instructor, section dash instructor. Okay. That's one thing. But of course, if that associative entity has a meaning in the context of the application, might be a better idea to give it something more explicit. Okay. Section of the instructor is also fine, or instructor section, that's also fine. I'm calling it allocation because an instance of this represents the allocation of one instructor to a section. That is, in other words, this instructor has been allocated to teach this section. Okay. So I would like to call it as allocation or instructor allocation, if you like, to make it really clear. You could call it instructor allocation. Okay. But I'm perfectly fine if you just choose to call it instructor section, period. No allocation, just instructor section. Right? In other words, what you did is you just combined the names of the two participating entities and gave it as the name of this entity type. That's fine with me. Okay. Now, as I've already said, whenever you've got an associative entity type, you can always come up with meaningful attributes for the associative entity type. Okay. In this case, I thought, okay, if a section has multiple instructors and each allocation represents the allocation of one instructor, then what percentage of the class is that instructor teaching? Or how many hours is a particular instructor teaching? Right? It's possible that there are two instructors teaching a class, but one of them is teaching 90% and the other is teaching only 10%. Okay? That may need to be noted in the context of an organization. You can't give equal credit to both because one person may be doing the lion's share of the work. Okay? In any case, it's required for us to know this and that's what this is. Okay? So again, the primary key for allocation is through key migration, the primary key of section and the primary key of instructor. Okay, but we already know, uh, in fact, this is wrong. Let me fix that. 